anyone names Jones that I'm, I have to, in my head, it just keeps going, me and Victor, Victor Jones, Victor Jones, Victor please, Jones. Please, <laughs> what? I beg you never to do that again. Okay, I won't. That's good. We won't. I won't. Uh... Welcome back to the Futures Edge podcast. I'm Jim Muriel. As always, the brains behind the operation, executive producer and co-host, Bob Iacchino. Today, another special guest. I say it every week. We get the best guests in the financial world, and today is not an exception. We have chief strategist at Tasty Trade, Victor Jones. Thank you for coming, Victor. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I've been watching your guys' podcast. You have amazing guests. Somebody must have canceled for, uh, <laughs> for me to get the invite. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. As you know, we have to start with the lightning round because we have to establish your credibility. Go. You walk into a bar. First off, where? what's the bar? What's your favorite bar on the planet? Can be in any place, too. Oh, it's a, it's a grimy bar in Omaha, Nebraska called the Green Onion, notorious for, for, uh, awesome. for uh, heavy hand pouring. Wow, that's a fantastic answer. And what? So you walk to the bar and what do you order? What's your drink? Oh... Uh, it's uh, it's kind of boring. It's an old fashioned. I like old fashioned. It's not boring at all. I think old yeah, fashioned. Like no, we're Midwestern guys here. We do old fashioned too. So now, does it bug you when you're driving to a bar with your wife, and you sit down at the bar, and you've known what you were going to order the entire <laughs> drive? You're looking forward to it, and the bartender says to your wife, "What would you like?" And she's like, "Hmm, I don't know. How much does that bother you, or is that me?" Uh, <laughs> let me see. If she if she's watching, not it doesn't yeah. bother me at all, doesn't honey. Bother at all. Doesn't bother right. me at all. Let's figure this out together. If if in fact she's not, same thing. Every you you're gonna end up ordering the same thing. I know what you're gonna order. We just gotta yeah. do the exercise. Let's jump, jump to it. No doubt about it, Bobby. Do you can I throw really some? Can I throw some in with that really quick? So sure. I'm in, I'm on my second marriage, and <laughs> the second marriage is the best one. And did it break up vouch. because you didn't know what to order at the bar? I can vouch for that, that the second marriage is the correct one, but I'm not <laughs> saying the other one of you should change where you're at. But what I will say is that my first wife went into a restaurant knowing exactly what she wanted to order to the point of it wouldn't even be on the menu. Mm. So like I'll have the Caesar salad, but I don't want Caesar dressing and no lettuce, use kale and don't add chicken. I'd like you to add <laughs> shellfish, preferably <laughs> uh, a langoustine uh, shrimp. And just completely change it. And then we get home and she'd be like, that restaurant sucked. <laughs> well, you did the menu. <laughs> this particular wife that I will be with forever because I'm, she's freaking amazing, mm -hmm. can't pick off the menu because she doesn't want to be mean. So oh, there we like, go. Everything looks so good. I don't know. Empathy's good. Yeah. Empathy's great. Yeah, it was good. I guess they're equally annoying. That's my point. <laughs> when I now, when I go to a high-end restaurant, I will say to the waiter, if he looks like he really knows what he's doing, I say, I'm gluten-free and I barely eat dairy. With those instructions, just bring me what you think is going to be great. And I've done that a couple of times and it really Ooh. works out nice. Oh, but it's only if a waiter, you can tell he has a lot of damn pride. Yeah, in waiter's choice. That's like going to a barber and say, you know, no, <laughs> make me look good. <laughs> it's actually yeah, what happened to me on Thursday. Month. That's what happened to me this <laughs> what, Thursday. Literally. What happened to you? Did you get his name? We should, there should be revenge. But anyway. <laughs> Um, okay, so we are recording this on Friday afternoon. Yeah. We are jovial, and it's because of the alcohol. The markets were not very jovial today. No. Um, we saw some capitulation a little bit, it seemed like to me. The VIX curve inverted a tiny bit. Do you think there's enough panic yet, Victor? Um, I, it, no, is the short answer. No, I don't. I think uh, in the short term, would it surprise me if you get a little bounce and maybe we chase a little bit at the end of the year? We're having this conversation on my, on my show yesterday. No, not necessarily. But, you know, you're starting to see very prominent bulls on, you know, whatever mainstream media. They're flipping bear. That's a positive signal. But generally speaking, I know I'm oversimplifying. The most bearish people jump in and get long and they get their faces ripped off, too, at the capitulation points. And um, 
you know, everyone gets burned at the bottom. And I think, you know, we're probably not there in the short term. You've got enough signals or maybe you're getting a decent price to take a bet on risk in the short term. But uh, historically, markets, when you've seen inflation greater than 5%, they trade at 10 to 15 multiples. So right now, you got to believe in $240 roughly of earnings over the next 12 months or so, which I think is overstated. And you got to believe like a 16 multiple on that number is reasonable, which I don't. So, you know, maybe 3,400, give or take 100. I think you're starting to get into fair value zone, but uh, I don't think we're there yet. So, so do you think, we, last week's show with Steph Pomboy, we talked about the proverbial fed, fed put, which yeah. she said, well, the Fed put is gone. And I, I argue that the Fed put's not gone. I think that the Fed put strike price has just changed quite a bit. And they, I, I genuinely think they want to destroy wealth. I think that's another element of their tool bag to fight inflation. 100%. And I think that they're perfectly comfortable with the stock market going down. But if we, if they, that's all easy to say, but if it takes out that 3,600 level and starts cascading and making new lows, do, do you think the Fed, that adds pressure to the Fed to pivot to neutral? I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, I don't mean, we have, we've had this running argument about going to neutral is not actually a pivot. A pivot has to be, but anyway, so that's why I threw that in. But do they, do they move to neutral quickly because of that? Are they close to moving to neutral anyway? Let me, I'll say we're close to what the market currently believes might be neutral or restrictive territory. We don't know that, and we're not going to know that for a while. So that's a big assumption. Assuming that, uh, you know, we are right, inflation break-evens aren't wildly incorrect. Um, I don't think we're close to a Fed pivot. I think it just depends on how you think about this. What, what needs to happen? If asset prices continue to lower, but the credit markets are functioning, the treasury markets are functioning, you don't have, you know, liquidity or credit freeze-ups, I don't I don't see lower asset prices as a reason for the Fed to be concerned. It's really the the liquidity and credit freeze up that they're worried about. And last time around, and I don't know if I'm misreading the tea leaves, it's almost like when the market gets too aggressive, Powell will give you a very strong message and the whole mm -hmm. Fed will be united. When the markets get weak, the Fed message sort of you get dispersion in it. Maybe you get a Raphael Bostic is coming out and he's saying, hey, maybe there's a reason to pause in the horizon or, or you know, daily starts. You start to see dispersion in the message. And it's, so it's almost like you can tell that they don't want the thing to get rolling too far down um, in negative territory because now you've got to worry about potentially stimulating. And I don't think they want to even they want to go near having to do that. So this, the, what struck me today, and I think part of the reasons we were, and Bobby and I are mostly technical traders too, but we use fundamentals to bolster. I, am I right in characterizing you as kind of similar? Um, I don't, I don't know if I'm technical so much as I'm, I like the two, the two styles I like the most are volatility traders. I think volatility traders don't see the world in binary outcomes. They see the world through a distribution curve. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I like macro traders because I think they have a real keen sense of incentive. When you understand money and incentive, you might not get people's behavior right in the short term or asset prices right in the short term, but you have a better chance of understanding how incentives might sway prices or behavior in the longer term. So I, I think of technicals as a nice kind of short term uh, engaging entry and exit, but I think vol and macro tends to drive my decision making. Okay, good. So let's. So the, the, from the macro standpoint, then today we saw um, things cascading lower. Uh, it was a, a bad down day. Um, this this news out of the UK, the massive tax cuts. I had to read the headline like three times. And again, I've never met a tax cut that I wasn't one hundred percent behind until possibly today. Yeah. This is an odd odd timing of this tax cut. So I think that was the reason the pound got absolutely hammered. I'm sure you saw, you know, our, our dollar stronger. But I also think there's an element of the, the market is starting to realize that there's no way the Fed can possibly know if they've gone too far, not enough, um, or the right amount in the short term, because everything has a, a, a lag effect. So yep. we're, we could be at a point now, let's say there's this huge range that we've gone up into that maybe we've done enough. So what, when you look at the market getting hammered today, do you think that the, the market's thinking that the Fed's gone too far or is that just was it a reaction to the UK? Um, it's probably, you know, when it rains, it pours. It's a little bit of everything. I look at what the what numbers the Fed put on the table uh, the other day at the FOMC announcement. 
And I like to look at the, you know, the dots or the projections for 2022, 2023, and 2024. And I think the, the question that I asked myself when they put the numbers out, they said growth's going to be way less than we told you before. It's not going to be 1.7 for 2022. It's going to be 0.2%. It's not going to be 1.7 for 2023. It's going to be 1.2%. So no, we're not going to be at trend. We're going to be below trend. And then for 2022, they said, best case scenario, we get back to trend growth in a few years from now. And what did they say about unemployment? It's going from, you know, 3.7, 3.8%. We actually, th we think it's going to go up to 4.4%. I think people have to understand just how novel it is for the Federal Reserve to tell you they're going from 3.7, 3.8 to 4.4 percent. They're telling you what they're trying to engineer without without explicitly saying it to everybody. But but nobody's looking at the data. I think a lot of markets are listening to Jerome Powell and going, is he did he sound hawkish or did he sound dovish? It's like, bro, if you read those numbers and you believe in what they're telling you, it it doesn't matter if he come, came out and saying when doves cry, like it wouldn't have mattered how soft he was in his message if you believe the numbers they put on the table. <clears throat> and so the and, and by the way, their expectations of where inflation is going to go, it barely budged. So basically what they told you is it's going to get way worse. And we don't actually think that um, bumping up unemployment or lower GDP, that's actually going to have a meaningful growth uh, change in how we see inflation over the next couple of years. So I think to myself, how do you how does that happen? The only way that happens is is if the previous two or three SEPs, these previous projections have been so wildly off, what could have ever been thought of as reality, right? In December, they told us that GDP growth was going to be 4% for 2022. They told us that unemployment was going to be 3.5%. It wasn't going to budge. And they told us they weren't going to have to raise Fed funds rate above point above 1%. Like that's called magical disinflation. That just doesn't exist. I can't find a period in history where inflation takes care of itself. And I think that was wildly inaccurate. And I think yesterday they got closer to telling a realistic story. But even now you have to go, is 4.4% really as bad as it could get on the unemployment front? Even that potentially, depending on how frictional unemployment rolls from like, I'm employed, but there's a bunch of jobs available, that's possible. That also might be a bit optimistic. So they're giving a more realistic picture of the future. And the more realistic picture was, it wasn't that optimistic to begin with. So I have one more, Bobby, then I want you to come in if you can too. Um, okay, so you mentioned inflation. So. You've seen dry goods, you know, Baltic dry goods index collapse. You've seen the break evens you mentioned, both twos and five yeah. years are projecting very rosy things. We've seen oil, lumber, copper, some very, very key commodities, essentially crater. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that inflation is probably less bad now, or maybe even gone, but it's not going to it's not going to appear that way because the owner rents equivalent in the um, in the CPI is, is just getting going, despite yeah. the fact that the real estate market is probably cratered too. Do you think my assessment's accurate or do you think inflation is still going to rage going forward? So I have a two-part answer and I would agree with you 100,000%. I think that is the concern. The, the market concern seems to have shifted from how high is inflation going to, is the Fed looking at real-time data or are they looking at this government lag statistic? So that lag statistic, you talk about owner's equivalent rent. I don't know if we want to go into this now, but I can kind of give you my thoughts on this. Uh, are Bob, you or kidding? Yeah. It? Yeah. There's a lot of smart people yeah. who watch this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they can handle the weeds. Yeah. Well, then I'm outside the tail of that distribution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the left tail then. Um, <laughs> but I think this podcast is great. So my thought is on owner's equivalent rent, I don't think I'm saying anything novel, right? But I think a lot of people are just flapping their gums when it comes to whether they think inflation is going up or going down. If you do the work and you dive into how is this number composed, you go, okay, 33-ish percent is weighted towards shelter. Okay, what is that number? It's owner's equivalent rent. Okay, what does that mean? How do they take that number? Well, twice a year, they're going to call people and they're going to ask them, are you renting or do you own your house? And they say, if, if I say I'm renting, they go, what do you pay for your rent? If, the, if you say you own your house, then they say, okay, if you were to rent your house right now unfurnished, what would you rent it for? Now, I'm guessing a lot of people in the world are not real estate agents, right? So they probably just say whatever their mortgage is, they tack on something else, and that's, that's the number. 
it's not they don't do this for a bad reason it's smooth and lagged arguably for a good reason but the problem is likely last year when you saw six or seven percent in that number it was so la- the shelter component was so lagged that the reality on the ground was probably double digits back then on the flip side what can happen given this lag number when we all see commodities rolling when we see wage moderation potentially happening you see housing data rolling you see zillow rents all that stuff's rolling and the risk here is going the Fe- does the fed see this like are they seeing it like the the 8.3 that you see now perhaps is lower given the lagged impact of owner's equivalent rent so the understated inflation last year potentially rolls to cyclically overstated inflation. Now, the problem, in my personal opinion, is you can have two things at once, short-term cyclical deflation and long-term structural inflation. So if the, the C, the basically the, the force down on um, you know, our monetary and fiscal policy for a long period of time, the downward force has been cheap labor from China, cheap energy supply, global trade that has been lubricated, open borders for trade. That stuff clearly is turning around. Jem Carson likes to say we're moving from a cooperation game to a competition game. And if that's true, you could potentially be seeing the tailwind turn into headwinds. So you could see longer term secular inflation even though in the short term perhaps you're seeing some signs of secular deflation i suppose that's the way i think of it perhaps in two two different minds instead of singular no but that was amazing bobby you're up wow um all the questions i prepared are gone <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no no it's not that they were asked and answered but you just brought up so many interesting things and i'm going to go on record as saying you do belong in our guest list um i'll start with this um i follow you on twitter pretty closely i follow you and jim uh somebody once said to me i don't know how jim has time to work and <laughs> I'm the the same podcast. <laughs> yeah we mentioned in the podcast we, we tried to explain to people people don't realize that when you're an active trader or even a broker or even a strategist a lot of your time is done thinking mm-hmm. you know you're not necessarily just all over the place like we used to be in the 90s um the 2000s on the trading floor but anyway On Twitter, you said, I hate when people say when retail, and I'm paraphrasing, Mm. retail capitulates, I'll go in. I'm retail and I'm not, I am not a capitulator or something to that effect. Can you go into that a touch? And then I want to ask you about inflation and and CPI as well. Yeah. So um, a, a person, a gentleman put out something that said, when retail pukes, that's, that'll be the time to buy something along those, those lines. And I said, I'm retail and I hate these types of sayings. I hate this very, very antiquated notion. Um, You know, I'm here every day and I'm not puking. (laughs) I have no plans of puking. And I think generally speaking, our little group of the world called this pretty, pretty well. Like we're not hurting, you know, we're not down uh, some factor of whatever the market is doing. And I think like there's an antiquated notion that retail is misinformed, that they're misguided, that they're, they have lack of education and what's happening in the world right now. And I think at one time, I will admit that there might have been some truth to that. But in a world where people like you, or, or where people like you guys will come on and, and on a daily basis, allow a retail trader to get in the mind of somebody who's seen this market before, how to think about risk and overexposure, underexposure, how to read signals, how to think about VIX term structure, how to think about capital allocation and when correlations go to one, how you manage risk through that difficult situation. There is now more than ever easy access to brilliant individuals. And those those people are helping retail navigate through this world as much as you want to I don't know if I can cuss on this. I'll keep you PG. As much as you want to no, dunk. No, no, no. Cut, cut as, cuss as much as you want. We encourage it. Who's cussing? <laughs> it's Friday afternoon, for God's sakes. <laughs> well, as, as much as you want to shit on the meme stock traders, right? They came up with originally, whoever was in that trade initially identified a weakness in market structure, and they exploited the weakness of market structure. That's game theory, that's market structure, that's risk, capital allocation, and in a weird way, you know, it's it's like, you know, it's kind of market manipulation when you all gang up to buy, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. 
But the point is, the, the initial idea behind that, that, you know, you can say hedge funds came in there and they it was wolf in sheep's closing. They helped to push that up. And I'll give you that. But the point is that there's a retail kernel there where they, they dissected market structure and they took advantage of it. There are people navigating this market right now, retail traders that since January, since October, were able to read the tea leaves and they positioned defensively or potentially on the short side. You know, there's just more informed conversations that are happening out there in the retail landscape. You don't see them represented in mainstream media. That's unfortunate. But the truth is, a lot of those people sitting on those desks talking about stocks, they don't, they're not licensed. They're not managing capital, some of them, which means they themselves are retail. <laughs> so yeah. I think people That's forget that, answer. you know? No, that's a great answer. And it's one of the reasons Jim and I both have individual but similar problems. We were both regulars on CNBC and uh, both of us kind of just decided not to be anymore for reasons we don't need to go into. I'll go into my story, but I don't want to put Jim in that position. But um, <laughs> I love I my story. Said, <laughs> I've said it alone that CNBC is the TMZ of financial media now. And this is why these kinds of things are important to do every week. From the seat, from the... Let me rephrase that because I'm going to ask about PCE here, because from an okay. inflation perspective, I'm sure you saw it. It was going around on Twitter when inflation in developed economies gets above 5%. OK, it takes an average of 10 years to get back to 2%. Mm -hmm. Now, the most recent example, I better pull it up because I might quote it wrong. Most recent example was in the Netherlands in 2001. Uh, it took a little over three years to get back to 2% after getting above 5%. And there's gonna be some base effects, no doubt. And I think sometimes a lot of people think that healthcare, insurance, wages, that those things are gonna turn around and go down with commodity prices and energy mm. and some parts of the food curve as mm. the supply chain eases. And it's my view that they're not. Mm -hmm. now, do I think the rate of change of inflation peaked? I think there's a chance that that happened. But when you consider how far we've gone and what a short period of time, is 4% year over year, does it feel like 4% mm. to your average person? Or does you feel like you're adding in the 15% from the last 25 months exactly. on and the 4% on top of that? So I guess my question is in PCE, housing is only 16% of the index and they don't use owner equivalent rent. Mm -hmm. And the core PC year over year got to 5.3%. Yep. So since the Fed likes to tell us they look at PCE and we all like to talk about CPI because that's what our friends and our clients and our grandmothers all talk about, mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the relationship with PCE? And do you think it's still such a, I don't want to say rosy scenario because you didn't picture it that way, but an easier scenario than I guess the doom and gloomers are saying? Um, you know, this really is a really long one. It's a tough, you know. I think the difficult thing about going on like mainstream media is you can, it's very hard to say, I don't know, right? But environments like this, I think, and especially in markets like this, I think you gotta be humble. And the answer to your question is, I don't know. I think in right. June, the Fed has had, uh, I think core PCE somewhere around 4.3%. And I think we're in the ballpark of that area. So in a weird way, the Fed could say, we are kind of on target with what we thought core inflation were where it would be by the end of the year. I mean, there's, there's, there's a way that you could say since March, they were close to, the, to wherever we ended up. Yeah, it was 4.8, so yeah, very close. Yeah. So, but also I think, uh, what was that, two, two press conferences ago, one Jackson Hole ago, like I can't even remember, I can't, can't keep track of all these speeches anymore. <laughs> In, in a way, I wish they would go back to like the Greenspan era. Just stop talking, move rates, and don't say a word anymore. And I wonder hey, if we'd hey, all be man. better off for it. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, but At I least think talking language we can't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, that's uh, Greenspan's quote, right? If you think you if you think you understood me, you misunderstood. <laughs> I think that was Greenspan's <laughs> quote. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah. Anyways, to your point. One of the things Powell also said was they asked him, what is more important? Are you looking at core or are you looking at headline? Are you looking at PCE? Or are you looking at CPI? And I think at one point in time, he said, it's all important. I think the, the average consumer feels the pain of headline. And he basically 
drew this halo saying we are going to be looking at and addressing all areas. So it's hard to know, quite frankly, and I, I wish I knew the answer to that, but it's a great Jimmy, I've got one for both of you, if I could. Um, sure. This is, so Jimmy and I, Victor, have been sort of two sides of the same coin for a long time. And I, I had a friend of mine, he was actually the person who trained me in the markets 29 years ago. We still talk every day. And he said to me, the Fed has to stop. They have to, you know, they have to pivot. They have to stop quantitative tightening. It's a wrecking ball through the global economy. And I, and I said this as an honest question. So many of us, I know Jimmy's this way. I think you've been this way, but I'm going back to an in-person conversation from like three and a half years ago that you and I had. Um, why are so many of us, and I'm including myself in this, afraid to say that the Fed will do what we've been screaming we'd like them to do for mm -hmm. a long, long time? Mm -hmm. And I mean that outside of economic conditions. Obviously, all of us were saying, especially Jimmy was loud about it, that they needed to hike rates when the economy was stronger 12, 16 months ago. But overall, we've told the Fed normalize and get out of the way and they're doing it now. Why do all three of us and everyone I talk to find it so hard to believe that they'll do that? Because uh, I think you're right. I, I think people are screaming about something that they wanted them to do for a long time. I think the, the rub here is the timing, right? You're, you're tightening into not only a domestic slowdown, you're tightening into a global slowdown. You're going to make things worse. Um, there, if you want to talk about retail, you want to talk about bad traders, the Fed is your ultimate, you know, start making the saying about the Fed instead of retail traders, because that's the, your definition of a bad trader is when you don't sell into strength and you don't buy weakness. And you've got a group of board governors that refuse to sell strength and uh, don't know how to buy, you know, I, I, arguably they can buy weakness, but they won't sell strength. And now you're in this situation where I think a lot of people got caught with recency bias, right? A lot of people want to believe <clears throat> that, the, that the mechanism to prop up markets that existed for 40 years, they've been making these calls, right? They've been saying this, this stock's going to go to this price, this stock, you, this is a good investment. It didn't matter. Beta supported you. And for 15 years, you could be an idiot, pick anything, and that beta would have supported you. So by now, you feel like a genius when you're calling out and nothing is going to work. Nothing is going to work when they're destroying capital, contracting money supply, and when global and global financial conditions are tightening. Just this week, I think 500 basis points of global tightening. Nothing's going to work in that environment, no matter how smart you think you are. And I think if, if you can get around the recency bias and go, where is the closest anecdote I can get to during, for this period of time? Some have gone to the 40s, some have gone to 68 through 82, but in both scenarios, you look and you go, there's a potential of positive real rates. There's a potential that the market expectations should not be 15% year over year. It should not be 10% year over year. It might be five to 7% if you're lucky. Like when I was in school, Bob, you, they told you asset, asset price expectations should be 7% per year when I was in school. Now, just given the post GFC uh, uh, stimulus, it's, that's gone from 7 to 10% in like a decade because the average returns over the last few years are so skewed to the upside. So thinking about a world of positive real rates, uh, a world where assets may perhaps don't return what you think they are and returning to a, a stock market where you're thinking of assets as as income right you're buying assets for it to produce income with lower volatility that world is so far away that i think it took a lot of people a long period of time to to sort of wrap their heads around what inflation actually means and how it turns off the function that created the last 40 years to the upside so, I mean, so Bobby, I, I would answer it slightly differently in, in two different ways. First of all, we, for a year and a half saying Fed should do this, Fed should do this, do this. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable to say, God, when we get to the amusement park, I'm going on that roller coaster. We, I'm going on the roller coaster. But right when you get to the top going, oh, shit, you start to go down. <laughs> I don't think that that's unusual for people yeah. to be that way. But secondly, you mentioned we want the Fed to normalize rates and get out of the way. If I was convinced that's what they were doing and they knew what normalized rates yeah. were, I mean, I'd like, I, you know, there's an argument, should the Fed exist, should the Fed not exist? I, I 
if the Fed could do what it set out to do, which was to take the edge off the deepest recessions and try to normalize things, I think that there's a perfectly reasonable spot for Fed. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that for decades. They, they get in the way of everything. They monkey up with normal market function. And right now, they're probably doing the same thing. And that's why only my, my calls for them to, to I, I wanted this 75 basis point cut. I mean, like, but going forward, now I want them to look around and say, what is going to happen? And that's a lag effect. And they won't do that. And that's my complaint. So, so I, again, I don't think they're out of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah makes that, that, sense. So the what if is, the what if is, what if what they just did does not take care of inflation? Right. Yeah. What if that's a good point. we are? What if we'll see? Uh, what if inflation ends up being volatile? What if we're in a period of structural inflation, not just the cyclical inflation, the transitory inflation? Like my read is, I think the Fed was pretty convinced that this was demand side inflation. I think they were pretty convinced. I think once Russia invaded Ukraine they realize that there's a potential here for structural inflation, that the, that the cyclical inflation, def, inflation narrative is potentially off the table if, if complete deglobalization ends up happening. Like that is a bunch more difficult problem for them to deal with. And if that's the case, that they need to normalize much quicker. It's, you know, without that risk, perhaps we are in the middle of just cyclical inflation, but I think it changed the game for them so then you got to get to this place where you say, let's try to get to a reasonable neutral and just see what happens. And I think we're in the see what happens part of this plan. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that you mentioned structural, you know, probably something going forward a little bit too. And then you mentioned Russia, the obvious geopolitical risk and the obvious effects that it has. And back then when I was arguing with people who I was arguing with people who were suggesting that was the whole thing. And it's not the mm. whole thing because there was yeah. obviously some supply side um, supply constraints that were happening because of global shutdowns, it still exists because of global shutdowns too. When you look at the structural part of it, are you basically just saying supply chain problems coupled with geopolitical supply chain problems that came from these the lockdowns and then the uh, structural risk based on geopolitical, right? Um, yes. Is there more yes. to it? Yeah. No, that's, that, I think that's fair. I think there's a risk that consumer preferences, you lock people in their houses for two years, their value systems can change, their habits can change. So it's very possible that I think people were expecting the post pandemic economy to mirror the pre pandemic economy. So what people seem to be grasping is that the post pandemic economy is completely new. It's a new baseline and how to think about not only the economy, but the supply chains and people's preferences are going to change. And that's going to take time for the supply chain itself to normalize through. Then there's, you know, there's too much risk in keeping manufacturing operations in some of these places, China, for example. Sure. How do we onshore, nearshore some of that? What is the cost? How does that change the cost structure? And then to your point, like we've opted out of energy solutions uh, for good or bad reasons. We've opted out. What does that do? If Wait, Ukraine... for good or bad reasons? You right. tell me. We're at, we, t we give our honest opinion on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Come on, roll, <laughs> roll bad reasons. It was dumb. <laughs> you got to build a bridge before you blow up the other bridge, right? I think so. I think, yeah, I think energy policy, like, so before Russia, before the sanctions, just energy policy in general, uh, it does not make a lot of sense. And I understand caring about the econ or the, the climate. I understand that. I think it is irresponsible it's just bad planning to think to not have a transition plan. I've done a bunch of technology rewrites in my day. And what you always have to do is plan to do two teams at once. You need one team managing existing tech and a new team to build a new technology because you need the flexibility to do transition. It seems like our planning completely eliminates any need for bridge fuels or bridge solutions. That is a bad, that's just bad planning. I don't care what your motivation is behind it. And we can see, we can look out and we can see people that get themselves in situations where they don't have energy dependence and we can see the ramifications. So why would we ever do that to ourselves? We can see current day examples and previous day examples. That's why the SPR exists, right? Um, 
Does it and still exist? It existed yesterday, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the sanctions, man, I don't know. Like <laughs> yeah. the sanctions are tough. What do you you know that India is really interesting here, right? India is saying, I'm gonna play middle ground. I'm gonna yeah. do what's best for my consumer and and my moral duty and obligation is to my consumer. You might not like that, and they might not be helping the the cause, but they also are thinking about social unrest and how do we keep how do we make sure we keep the people give the people what they need. So okay, so so that this brings up an interesting question. I wanted to branch into the um, Green New Deal, whatever the hell they call it, whatever. So the fact that they pushed it too hard before they they hadn't built the new bridge yet, they blew up the old bridge to a certain extent, not completely. So does this is the ball rolling with enough momentum? that it can last, and I mean the push toward green energy, because I'm going to go into like metals markets and copper and things like that. I'm actually giving a speech on copper in a couple of weeks, uh, which I think is very, very interesting. So is is the fact that they went too quick gonna blow up the whole thing? Are the next couple election cycles, is it gonna be a primary concern of people to vote out knuckleheads who pushed green without a plan? And then are we going to derail the whole thing, which would suck too, by the way, as a, as a conservative, I'm into conservation. You know, I like the environment and I don't want plans to go completely awry. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think this midterm uh, gas prices perhaps have come down enough that it might not be on the front of people's minds going into, into the midterms. And perhaps that's by design. Uh, over a longer term, it seems like this solution is not sustainable. So over the long term, depending on how long the geopolitical conflict drags out um, and how bad energy demand assumptions become, if you assume that that, that uh, demand imbalance will remain, then yeah, it probably comes back around and it probably is on the front of people's minds in the 2024 election, while it might right. be dampened in 2022. But so my thesis and. Bobby, this is going to be for both of you. Bobby, I'd actually like to get you in this first. My thesis mm -hmm. for copper is that, we, and I, again, I hate to pull the veil off before because I've been working on this quite a bit, but the fact that the dollar screaming through the roof and the Fed is, is hawkish and the fact that China has had these intermittent lockdowns, what seems to be really nonsensical COVID policies, and all of a sudden copper has been pummeled at the same time we're pushing for an all electric world and mm -hmm. copper still is without really a competitor as the the best conductor. I keep looking for, and we'll bring Mike Arnold, who's our technical strategist too. And I, I, before I do the speech, I want to know where, there, I believe that copper is going to be the trade perhaps for the next 10 years. And I don't think I'm alone on that. Have you looked at copper? What are your thoughts? Or who wants to go first? Victor, yeah, you go first. You're talking about well, I'm, I'm curious so, to get Bob's thoughts. Yeah. When okay, you say good. you've looked at copper and you think it's the trade for the next year, do you mean buying it? I, I think it's a trade for the next 10 years is what I said. Yeah, buying and it. I'm not, buy, I'm it. not touching it now. The chart looks like death. To me, mm -hmm. doesn't it? But you want to be long it for 10 years because that I agree with. I yeah. Mean, from my perspective, I actually had a conversation, a very casual conversation with somebody today who we, one of the things that makes me the, I don't want to say angry because I don't get angry. Um, I get angry about a lot of things, but this isn't one of them. It, one of the things that makes me the most uh, annoyed about these sort of green ideologies is electric cars are freaking fantastic if you're a car enthusiast. And the most popular one is American made. It's like literally conservatives who drove Chevelles mm. should love these things. I mean, mm -hmm. they're fast, they're reliable, they're all they're terrifyingly things. fast. Yeah. They're terrifyingly fast. But like, my, I mean, the Kia is faster than my V8 Mustang, you know? But from that perspective, when it gets shoved down somebody's throat, like a lot of things, they don't like it the second day. It's like, no, if you're going to force me to do it, I won't do it. But the it is to me the future. Either way, it may be stalled because you said 10 years, I'm on board. When you've got a global recession and a wrecking ball of this strong U.S. dollar going through the world like it is right now, you're going to see some weakness in those industrial metals. That's just what's going to happen. Um, but certainly, I wouldn't start buying copper today. But if you're going to buy it for the next 10 years, um, as much as I can legally guarantee anything, you're making money. Because these <laughs> things are the future. Uh, electrification is the future because in a lot of cases, it actually makes more sense than what we're doing right now. And, and Victor, for your knowledge, just like Jimmy said, who doesn't like cleaner air and water? Just right. don't freaking tell me what to do. 
Yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to be told. I want to be convinced. Bob, what's your, what's your thoughts? It's been a while since I heard your thoughts on, on current energy markets and energy policy. Do you mind if I ask for that? I'm, I'm a better Not host than I'm a better asking questions <laughs> than answering them. <laughs> well, actually, we need to go into the trades anyway. And, and if you're happy to stay for another 10 minutes or so, um, every week, Jim and I do trades and we ask our guests to stand and critique them or okay. they just can go and start their weekend. So if you want to stay another 10 minutes, my I don't have a new trade this week. I'm married um, with two kids, Bob. I'm staying <laughs> as long. I'm married with two kids. I will stay as long as you guys will have me. Okay. You're this is as much time today as I'm, I'm going to be using four syllable words and not saying poo poo and potty. Okay. I'll stay here as long as you'll have me. All right. So I'll make you feel comfortable. My fucking copper trade didn't figure <laughs> during the week. And I'm glad it didn't because it was a copper long as Jimmy knows, but it was, a, I was waiting for a weekly close. It didn't happen. So I don't have a trade this week because when things move this much, which is my CNBC story, by the way, when things move this much, I don't trade them. But two weeks ago uh, on the ninth, I think that's two weeks ago, I went short crude oil at about 89.60. Okay. WTI crude oil futures at about 89.60. And I had a stop at 98.83, which we can get anywhere near. And the risk was about $1,193. My target on this um, is about 69.20. So that tells you what I think of energy markets right now. Now my ultimate, my target's actually like 68.18 and then 64.50. But when we get that far off, I like taking profits, especially when it's almost two times what my risk initially was. So I have now tightened the stop up to a $200 profit on the micro. The risk prior was uh, risking 11.953 to make 17.60. The risk currently with a new stop, which the new stop's now 8760, uh, I'll make $200 to make 1760. So I'm bearish uh, crude oil for sure. It's interesting because there's been more volatility in gasoline than there has been in crude oil. So I'm looking at it and going, okay, well, there's been, we actually had a price spike in the Chicago area. I mean, I'm in Florida now, but Chicago area gas prices started to head back up again this past week uh, by about eight or nine cents. And I'm like, why? Crude oil, is getting, crude oil is getting hammered. And there's so many other facets, including refinery restrictions and availability of refineries that affects gas prices that people don't see because normally, and normally it is, it's barrel of crude oil price, gallon of gas price. They go hand in hand. But in these strange times, it's different. So I think Jimmy's right about the 10-year copper trade. I think it's one of the most right things I've ever heard him say. And that's not a, that's not a knock. He's right a lot. I'm right more, but he's right a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the 10-year copper trade is a no-brainer, and I'm short crude oil, and I'm staying short. Victor, he just said about crude oil, and I, I've been bearish a little bit crude oil, too. When you look at it, and you mentioned the SPR, and I think that's a factor. I don't think it's an enormous factor. I think I had always argued that when crude was going up, them deciding to sell the SPR wouldn't have much of a fact. It's trying to push back a tide. All of a sudden, when market position turns and perhaps there's demand destruction and then they start selling the SPR, well, then that clearly has much bigger effect because you're trying to push a car down a hill. Um, do you think this is a demand destruction thing or do you think it's a big SPR thing? I think it. I think it's definitely demand destruction. I think it's people repricing their expectations of of uh, global energy supply. I guess the the flip side is also true though about the SPR, right? Uh, I forget all the days are now blending together, but mm -hmm. at some point they started jawboning, saying that if oil came below eighty, that they would potentially start to refill start the to SPR. Refill it, right. I, I looked at that. I don't know how you guys interpret that. I looked at that as trying to give the oil like oil markets confidence that there would be a bid there so that they don't necessarily take down production, which would then exacerbate the low supply. But, you know, I don't know if that's real, that's a real bid or if it's not, how do you guys think about the administration's sort of like, I don't know, the jaw boning at 80. My quick answer is I thought it was a fairly smart thing to do for the reasons you mentioned, but Bob's going to have a much better answer. Well, first of all, the Department of Energy themselves did a study and they said that the release uh, probably adjusted crude oil by anywhere from 17 to 33 cents. And that comes from the Department of Energy under this administration. Now, that's it's not nothing, but it's kind of nothing. Right? <laughs> when you consider where crude oil was 
Oh, I thought you meant them saying it, considering they're, they may be political hacks like everyone else's mouth. So well, we, I, I did misunderstood you, you for a second. There. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if they were bragging about 17 to 33 cents <laughs> when crude oil was above five bucks, I don't oh, think- Oh yeah, that's rad. a great point. That's, that's solid, literally, yeah. Victor, that's like me bragging that I'm taller than Jim and I'm taller about like a quarter <laughs> inch and we're both short. So, you know, it's like a joke, but- yeah, I, I think from a perspective of, of announcing, they would start to expect bids around the $80. It's, it's John Kilduff was on our podcast a couple of weeks back, and he pointed out that, wow, that's just a no-brainer for crude oil companies because they're receiving SBR in the, in the low 90s, and they're basically replacing it in the low 80s, and they keep that margin. But just from a perspective of it keeping a floor under crude oil, I'm not sure this floor is enough because if you're talking about replenishing, we were at 707, we're going to be at like 434, and that's million barrels in the SPR prior. So you're going to have buyers of, let's just say it's 300 million barrels at 80 bucks. Uh, that's a half an hour in an oil trader's mind. Mm. It's really, it's, it's not going to do it, even though I agree that's probably why they did it. And I also agree it was smart to announce that. Okay, can we move on to the to the next trade? My next trade is silver. Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay, so this is you know the fundamental thesis for this. I mean, the the, the pound got caned today, dragged the euro with it. Even Canada got destroyed just because the you know the dollar strength part of it. Rates are going higher. I believe they're going higher. Um, I believe it's a mistake to keep going them higher, but the reality of it is. So this is a short term trade. And by the way, this is a short silver trade. And people who follow me on Twitter know that for two years. Basically, I've been long silver. It's gone from a great trade to a good trade to a bad trade. I don't feel that bad about it because it was supposed to be long-term investment money. Anyway, on the short-term trade, if uh, silver, the D micro silver contract trades 1865, which was about 10 cents from where it was. So this is a stop in trade. And if you guys watch and we talk about this all the time, it's counterintuitive to some people. I want to see a lower price before I sell it, meaning I don't want to be the first guy in. So to us, it makes sense. Trades 1865, a target on the downside of 1790, which isn't, you know, isn't all that ridiculous considering it's been kind of in the, a range popping around here for quite some time. And then a trade and then a stop up at 1910. If this trade gets down to 1790 and you hit your target, it, you make 750. If you get stopped out at 1910, uh, you, you lose 450. Again, that I like to put my stops a bit above nice round numbers because uh, you know, once they get above it, it might have some momentum. First of all, Victor, what do you think? Um, I, I like it. I like the idea of, as it's coupled with interest rates. And if this stuff is a real rates play, then I, I totally understand why you, why you would think that there's going to be pressure on gold and silver. I guess I'm not as active in gold and silver. I buy the physical and I just keep it around for the zombie apocalypse. And I've decided to Where do you keep not... it? Do you have it in a safe or do you have it out in the open somewhere? <laughs> First of all, I live in Chicago. You think I'm going to answer that question? <laughs> okay, good. Hey, okay. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm, <laughs> I was born yesterday. I wasn't, I'm I was born at night, joking. not last night. I know, it's, it's I know. It's right behind the guard dog, <laughs> yeah. butch and Sundance. <laughs> Quick story. I put, I know I'm going long. I just want to tell you this. I was going to sell my first car. I put it in the classified newspaper. It had rims on it. It had a CD player. It had speakers in the back. The guy calls. He asked me about all of the things on the car. He asked me about the security system. I tell him I didn't buy one yet, but I told him where he could get a really good one. He said, that can I come drive the car? I said, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't come. I wake up in the morning. My car is in my driveway on cinder blocks. Rims are gone. Speakers are gone. CD players are gone. So I will never answer. I will never fall for the okie doke again, Jim. It's a beautiful <laughs> lesson. It's just an expensive <laughs> lesson. That's right. <laughs> Bobby Silver. Um, I like precious metals to respond when the Fed pauses. So I like it. I uh, also own physical gold, and I've also owned uh, gold ETFs and futures since July. Oh, last, no, but my, mine is a well, short the for the next week. Yeah, mine's a short. No. For the next week, I like it because I think you, you know where I, where I stand in a Fed switch to neutral or possible pivot after that because you can't pivot to neutral. Um, I suspect that uh, precious metals will respond less to recession fears. Um, data, all the research I've done has shown gold to be a terrible inflation hedge, but mm. it's a great we think inflation is coming trade. Right. It's also a very good, the Fed is flipping to accommodative trade. 
So um, I like short it short term. I like long it much longer term. By the way, I'm going to add too. When you talk about the next 10 years and the green revolution or whatever the hell those crazies are calling it, um, I think silver figures into that a little bit too. So I am going to be looking for more longer term mm -hmm. silver positions too. And again, I have silver out the ass, which has been you know a terrible trade. Like I Do said, you guys which care at all. Do you guys care at all about the gold silver ratio? Do you track that? Do you think it's meaningful I do. at all? I, I watch it. I think it's meaningful. I don't, I'm not up on it recently. What's, what's it flashing us now? I think we're close to 90, right? Yeah. Or, some, yeah. or somewhere pretty Sounds elevated. Right. It's pretty elevated. Mm -hmm. I think we've I only think seen this level like 2020, 91 and like 1940. So it was pretty yeah. elevated. And That's I think it's actually going to shift and tighten up over the 10 year period that Jim's talking about because of the, the, electrification uses of silver that you yeah, mentioned right mm. yeah good okay let's get to rates and then i gotta get going i'd love to talk all day but let's so we we talked about now i'm going into the 10 year now and it's kind of technical that three and a half level seemed like a big deal once it went through it, it pushed through pretty pretty high so my trade in the 10 year is pulls back to 3.65 which by the way i don't know if you guys saw toward the end of the day yields by the way we trailed we trade um on this show the yield contracts i don't know if you're aware of them so yeah. they trade yield mm. not they're not like regular bonds so um so buying it at three six five with a target of that nice round number of four uh, percent. Realistically, let's change that to three point nine eight, just because you know we've seen it fail at big round numbers before too. But they do become somewhat of a magnet, and then a stop placed below at three forty, which is again below that psychological level of three and a half. So the question here is: In the next two weeks, do you think uh, ten year yields are continuing higher, Victor? Um, I am betting the opposite. So I'm starting to get a, in the very short term, a little bit longer, the long end. Um, if we only went to four and turned around, I could handle that pain. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm just uh, starting to bet that maybe I know we've cracked a critical support level in the 30 year, 10 years. Well, but I'm um, just sort of building a longer bond position or short yield position. The so the, yeah, the, where we cracked that again, Victor, for people watching, flipped it around to bond prices. That's the same level I was thinking about because it was about three and a half, right? And that's what we moved through. So that's why a lot of times I look at a trade knowing that's where my stop is going to be is yeah. back below that or above that, depending on how you're looking at, which is why I structured that. A quick note too, last year, the trade from the two year going lower, it never, it never got to my, in, my, to my trigger in spot. So I'm fine, never got in that. And then the one I mentioned in stocks, worked beautifully which was selling it at like 38 whatever and that's just for people who are keeping score from the sidelines which by the way i don't give a shit if you keep score or not um we like to trade and we like to talk about it bobby you got anything to finish off with any last questions for victor uh no well i have actually one more for victor what's with the vix not moving can you explain to people why it didn't move um i think i know why but i think people should hear from you i have an answer too after victor yeah. go mm. I had a conversation yesterday. I, all I can give you is my best guess. My best guess, <clears throat> my best guess is I don't think there's a ton of instant, like if you saw this coming, you sort of hedged, you bought skew, you bought, you know, you bought crash insurance a long time ago, and perhaps you've moved to a more neutral position. Uh, I think lots of large capital and hedge funds might be in a more neutral position and you start to get crashes like this there's less people running for put protection and there's probably more people that are comfortable selling vol here in this in this particular scenario i that's my guess I, probably way off agree boys i gotta go the other show's calling me i'm sorry about that victor so nice to meet you okay Jim, nice to meet you sorry i'm so yeah. long-winded man no not at all <laughs> No, it's not you, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, normally we go to about 4.30, 4.45, but Fox News called Jimmy, so he had to run off. And Why do you think it's uh, subdued? Uh, I think that it's basically exactly what you said. I mean, people forget that volatility is determined by options pricing, not the other way around. You know, a lot of people think, well, vol's up, so option prices are up. Actually, option prices are up, so vol's up. Mm -hmm. And when you see this, it says to me that this particular move on Friday was not it if it were going to continue simply because um, there we didn't get to strike prices, particularly on the downside, obviously, that caused the VIX to spike, right? So, I mean, you know as well as I do how these market makers have to shift and shift and shift and then uh, delta hedge and it becomes a much more of a snowball effect despite how bad Friday seemed to people. Um, so that to me is like, people are looking at the VIX and say, you know, we're down a lot. Why isn't the VIX up? Well, that's not really what determines it. 
a lot of these things we talk about, and I try to explain this because we talk to more retail now than we do institutional. A lot of the things we talk about are kind of like trinities and not dualities. There's always three things, right? So it's um, unemployment, interest rates, inflation, right? There, there's always a third thing. People are like, well, there's inflation. Well, why is you know gold lower? Well, it's the inverse relation to the dollar, dollar stronger. You know, there's always this third thing that people are looking at. And that, that was my thing with volatility is um, it was a light bulb moment for me when I realized it was the other way around, which believe it or not, not that long ago, you would think it was, it was 25 <laughs> years ago, but it wasn't, it was double digit years ago, but it wasn't 25 years ago. Yeah. Well, I just want to say you, you oftentimes we don't give it, we don't get a chance to give people the flowers they deserve. Uh, I just want to say there are times when people either directly or indirectly on Twitter and things like that, they help to shape your view of the world. And you've been one of those guys, Bob, for a really long time that have helped to shape my view of the world and have helped me navigate both good times and bad times, both directly on shows and with your commentary, indirectly with posts. And I just want to say thanks to both you and Jim. I think this podcast is great. It's one of my favorites. And hopefully we can get you you guys on uh, on our show, on Jones and Friends, on, on Tasty Trade one of these days. Yeah, that is, uh, we're, it's an absolute permanent yes. And, and I really appreciate that, man. I met you in person a few years back and we hit it off immediately. immediately. And by the way, Sean Cruz says hello. Uh, my wife and I had dinner with him and his fiance a couple of weeks ago. And he's a good guy. Text me today. He's like, Vic on your show? Tell him I said hello. Cool dude. I'm like, That's <laughs> Sean. That's exactly how Sean would say it. <laughs> so, Love you, Sean. But, Thank you for your service. Dude, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thanks, man. Cheers, brother. Peace.